Good morning. Welcome or welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. It is Tuesday, November the 12th, and we're here to look at the new releases that have been published this week in the category of mysteries and thrillers. Quick announcements. I do have sprints tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. They go for two and a half hours. I do them every Tuesday and Thursday evenings and also on Saturday afternoons at 3 let us jump in. I've been having some issues with my light, so if it goes darker, that is the reason. First up, Out in the Cold by Steve Erzini, uh, second in the Special Agent Alexandra Martell series. While sailing across the Mediterranean, as one does, the mega yacht Aurora is rocked with explosions taken under siege by unknown assailants. On board are some of Europe's wealthiest and most powerful political players, including the Secretary General of Interpol, a high-ranking Finnish diplomat, and Special Agent Alex Martel, whose lethal sniper skills kick in to bring them safely to shore. Someone is waging a ruthless campaign of attacks against Finland, one of NATO's newest members, in an attempt to throw the alliance into turmoil. Teaming back up with CIA agent Caleb, Alex is thrust into the middle of the fray, pursuing the villains from the waters off of Monaco to the Baltic Sea and home to American soil. As the U.S. is pulled deeper into the conflict, a global catastrophe seems ine inevitable. But who is really responsible for these escalating attacks on Finland? The Russians or someone much closer to home? As new allies surface and old enemies reappear, Alex has no way of knowing who to trust, and she might only have one last shot to keep the world from going to war. Sounds like a good contender for Spy versus Spy September. I'll have to mark that one. Hi, Ms. Blogger. How you doing? Big Breath In by John Straley. Sorry, need a coffee. Diagnosed with terminal cancer, retired marine biologist Delphine is on the brink of throwing in the towel. She has outlived her PI husband and worries she's become a burden to her son and his growing family. One night, while contemplating how to go on, Delphine witnesses a violent argument between a man and his girlfriend. When Delphine discovers the woman has gone missing along with her young child, Delphine embarks on a quest to find them. What begins as a chance encounter balloons into a rescue mission across the Pacific Northwest. Along the way, Delphine encounters the dregs of humanity, grappling with schemers, kidnappers, and murderers, as well as its joys. With the help of a few friends, a retired PI, and a queer biker gang, Delphine is determined to see her mission through, knowing full well it may be her last. All that in the kitchen sink. Burn This by Alex Kenna. Struggling private investigator Kate Miles is shattered to learn her late father isn't her biological dad. She's still reeling when she discovers that an unknown distant relative is the prime suspect in a decades-old murder investigation. Trying to convince her to take on the case for free, an old colleague recommends her as an investigator for a recent arson murder in the same small town. After giving up on a failed acting career, Abby Coburn is starting over as a promising social work student. With her life on the right track, she's determined to help her brother, Jacob, whose meth addiction triggered a psychotic break and descent into crime. But when Abby dies in a fire that kills two other people and destroys part of the town, the police immediately suspect Jacob. As the Coburn family grapples with the tragedy, Kate begins unraveling the cold case, but finds herself caught in the middle of an emotional minefield. Pretty soon, she discovers that this town is full of dark secrets, and as she comes closer and closer to figuring out the truth, Kate must solve both murders before she becomes the next victim. We are definitely on the darker side. Good afternoon, Helen. Every Arc Bends Its Radian by Sergio 
de la Pava. Riv, poet, philosopher, private eye, arrives in Cali, Colombia, hoping to find retrieve. Running away from an unspeakable event surrounding his ex, Jane, Riv accidentally connects with his cousin, Moro, and family friend, Carlotta, who asks him to find her daughter, Angelica Alpha Ochoa. No sooner is Riv on the trail when it becomes clear that not only are the cops not looking for Angelica, but they are actively preventing him from finding her. This could be a good thing because the police are clearly in the pocket of one Exeter Mondragon, a name best never uttered in public if one wants to stay alive. But Riv is not one to leave things incomplete. When his investigation leads him straight into the heart of Mondragon's criminal empire, he is forced not only to face unimaginable horrors, but also to plunge into the deepest and most perplexing conundrums of the human condition. End of row one. Deadly Animals by Marie Tierney. Finding a dead body is not normal, but Ava is not a normal teenager. Ava Bonnie is a compassionate and studious 14-year-old girl with a dark secret. She has an obsessive interest in the macabre. She is fascinated by the rate at which dead animals decompose. The highway she lives by regularly offers up gifts of roadkill. And in the dead of night, Ava loves nothing more than to pull her latest discovery into her roadside den and record her findings. This is a forensic uh, doctor in the making here. Or a serial killer, of course. One night, she stumbles upon the body of her classmate, and fearing that her secret ritual could be revealed, she makes an anonymous call to the police. But when Detective Seth Delahaye is given the case, Ava won't step back, not while teenagers continue to go missing. Racing alongside the police or against them, Ava is determined to figure out who is hunting her classmates before she becomes the next prey. How, how hard can it be to track a killer? Well, it depends on which genre you're in. Those Opulent Days by Jackie Pham. Good morning, Mary. Happy Tuesday. How are you doing, Helen? I hope your day is doing well. Indeed. And hi, Ms. Blogger. I am Zooming. Lots to get through. One will lose his mind. One will pay. One will agonize. And one will die. Dewey, Fong, Min, and Edmund have been best friends since childhood. Now, as young men running their family's formidable businesses, they make up Saigon's most powerful group of friends in 1928 Vietnam's elite society, until one of them is murdered. In a lavish mansion on a hill in Dalat, all four men have gathered for an evening of indulgence, but one of them won't survive the night. Toggling between this fatal night and the six days leading up to it, Told from the perspectives of the four men, their mothers, their servants, and their lovers, an intricate web of terror, loyalty, and well-kept secrets begin to unravel. As the story creeps closer to the murder, and as each character becomes a suspect, the true villain begins to emerge. Of course. Colonialism, the French occupation of Vietnam, and the massive economic differences that catapult the wealthy into the stratosphere while the poor starve on the streets. No, the person who killed the person is the real villain. For God's sake, people. Ugh. So tired of that. Clive Cussler, Desolation Code by Graham Brown, 21st in the Numa Files. When Kurt Austin and Joe Zavala investigate a mass stranding of aquatic life in the Indian Ocean, they accidentally uncover a much deeper mystery. A strange figure soon steals Numa's findings, forcing a high-speed chase. Someone really didn't want them examining those dead whales, but who and why? A cryptic text through the Numa satellite network makes things still stranger. These odd phrases and numbers look like Numa codes, but who could be tantalizing the crew with such specific knowledge of their tech? Are they being helped by an old friend or lured into a trap by a trader who knows a little too much about Numa's in his working? Kurt, Joe, and even Max, the agency's supercomputer will have to investigate like never before as they decrypt data, infiltrate a cult of cloned men, and prepare for a battle on two very different planes, one physical, one digital. The aquatic 
Stranding was just the beginning of a sinister plan concocted by a mind more brilliant than any they've ever faced, the mind of a machine. A new terrifying world order is being plotted. First marine ecosystems will be devastated, then the entire globes, unless the Numa crew can stop this code of desolation. Dun, dun, dun. David Baldacci has a new one <clears throat> in the 620 Man series. Uh, how's the search for the new service manager? Sure, hope a good one this time. Yeah, we interviewed somebody, but don't know if he's going to work out. We shall see. Uh, to Die For with David Baldacci, third in the 620 Man series. Travis Devine has become a pro at accomplishing any mission he's given. This, But this time, it's not his skills that send him to Seattle to aid the FBI in escorting orphaned 12-year-old Betsy Odom to a meeting with her uncle, who's under federal investigation. Instead, he's hoping to lay low and keep off the radar of an enemy, the girl on the train. But as Divine gets to know Betsy, questions begin to arise around the death of her parents. Divine digs for answers, and what he finds points to a conspiracy bigger than he could have ever imagined. It might finally be time for Divine and the girl on the train to come face to face. Divine is going to find out the difference between his friends and his enemies, and in some cases, they might well be both. End of row two. California Rain. I love David Baddall. She enjoyed the 620 Man series. Ah, new one to look forward to. How goes your uh, jewelry making for the show on Thursday? Los Angeles, 1950, when New York investigative reporter Mike Foyle learns that his World War II combat buddy, Bernie Crusher, is dead of an apparent suicide, he immediately suspects foul play. Arriving in Los Angeles to replace Crusher, who was reporting on the subcommittee of the House of Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, H-U-A-C, Foyle is, is, is faced with a mountain of roadblocks in picking up a winding murderous trail that leads to a scandalous Hollywood statutory rape trial and a dark secret about a powerful Southern California family. With colleague Kitty Chandler, Foyle is able to uncover Crusher's last moments that point to the historic 1950 midterm California elections. Set against the infamous Hollywood blacklist, California Rain is a noir break from the stereotypical homicide police investigation with a twist ending. Does that mean it doesn't end happily? Devil's Defense by Lori B. Duff. Made nine children's bracelets yesterday. More to go and have some other items that need to be replenished. I'm slow shaking. Oh no, which makes my work sometimes difficult. One bite at a time, bit by bit. You got it. Jessica Fisher wants nothing more than to build her law practice in small town Ashton, Georgia. She's well on her way when the local town hero football coach Frank Tripp Wishingham III hires her to represent him in a paternity suit. Coach is everything Jessica despises, arrogant, sexist, entitled. But it's her job to make him look good in public. This is made doubly difficult when her burgeoning relationship with a local reporter gets in the way of telling the truth. Are things as black and white as Jessica thinks? And can she find a way to succeed without compromising her own personal values or her personal life? Well, you shouldn't have become a lawyer. If you can't face those kind of conundrums. Oh, I'm snarky today. Good morning, Elena. How you doing? I'm feeling a little bit better than last week. Oh, good. I hope that continues. I think I was murdered by Colleen Cobble and Rick Ecker. Ooh, lots of blurbing here. Just a year ago, Katrina Berg was at the pinnacle of her career. She was a rising star in the AI chatbot startup everyone was talking about, married with an adoring husband, and had more money than she knew how to spend. 
Then her world combusted. Her husband, Jason, was killed in a fiery car crash. Her CEO was indicted, and as the company's legal counsel, Katrina faces tough questions as the feds take over and lock her out of her office. The final blow is the passing of her beloved grandmother. Her most prized possession is the beta prototype for a new ultra-sophisticated chatbot loaded onto her phone. The contents of Jason's email, social media backups, pictures, and every bit of data she could find were loaded into the bot, and Katrina has talked to him every day for the past six months. She has been amazed at how well it works. Even the syntax and words the bot uses sound like Jason. Sometimes she imagines he isn't really dead and is right there beside her. She knows it's slowing her grief recovery, but she can't stop pretending. On a particularly bad day, she taps out. Tell me something I don't know. The cursor blinks for several moments and seems frozen before the reply flashes quickly onto the screen. I think I was murdered. Distraught, Katrina returns to her cozy Norwegian-flavored hometown in the Northern California Redwoods and enlists the Redwoods, and enlists the help of Seb Wallace, local restaurateur and longtime acquaintance, to try to parse out the truth of what really happened. They must navigate the complicated paths of grief, family dynamics, and second chances, as well as the complex questions of how much control technology has. And staying alive long enough to do that is far more difficult than either of them dreamed. Interesting concept. Are you feeling your oats on level 58? I am. Level 58 is snarky. And Mary says, hi, Elena. Glad to hear you're feeling better. And I usually like Colleen Cobble. Fascinating. Yes, they come up with interesting things, don't they? Uh, the Starless by Lee Kelly and Jennifer Thorne. One perfect island, two rivals, a star-studded cast, but underneath the glitter, disaster is brewing. Summer 1958. Vivian Rhodes thinks she's finally landed her break playing Helen of Troy in Apex Pictures' big budget epic A Thousand Ships, an anticipated blockbuster meant to resurrect the failing studio. Naturally, she's devastated when she arrives on the remote Italian island of Tavali and finds herself cast as the secondary character, Cassandra, while her nemesis, the fiance stealing Lottie Lawrence, America's supposed sweetheart, is playing the lead role instead. The tension on set though, turns deadly when the ladies discover that members of the crew are using the production as a front for something decidedly illegal, and that they are willing to kill to keep their dealings under wraps. When the two women find themselves on the run and holding key evidence, Vivian and Lottie frantically agree to work together to deliver the proof to Interpol, hoping to protect both their lives and their careers. Stepping Staying one step ahead of corrupt cops and looming mobsters, the arch rivals flee across the seas. Their journey leads them into Monaco's casinos, Grace Kelly's palace, on a road trip through the Alps, even onto another film set before a final showdown back on Tivoli, where the lives of the entire cast and crew hang in the balance. Vivian and Lottie finally have the chance to be real heroines to save the day, the film, maybe even each other, but only if they can not can first figure out how to share the spotlight. I do like that cover. An interesting concept. And the bro three. Going Dark by George K. Mahawk. Mihawk? Mahawk. Lots of blurbage. In the aftermath of 9-11, remnants of bin Laden's al-Qaeda network quietly infiltrated the U.S. heartland, lying dormant for over two decades. On Thanksgiving Day, they strike, triggering a sinister cyber terrorist plot poised to plunge America into unparalleled digital darkness. But it's only the beginning. Paul Knox, a seasoned NSA cybersecurity expert and former Air Force communications officer, is thrust into a clandestine conflict spanning generations. As Knox delves into a complex web of cyber intrigue, he must confront both the mission's high stakes and personal demons, including the unwitting involvement of his daughter, Emma, a brilliant MIT computer scientist who holds the key to the next generation internet. 
The narrative intertwines with the origin story of the Liberty Unit's first member, John Jack Jouett. In 1791, Jouett embarks on a perilous mission to deliver a critical message from Thomas Jefferson to General Henry Knox, altering the Revolutionary War's trajectory. As the lines between past and present blur, Knox races against time to save his daughter and unravel the mysteries that could reshape history. Going dark won't be a problem for a man who spent his life tracking the worst of the worst on the dark web. But in this game, every move could be his last. Well, I'm intrigued. A Liberty Unit novel. Like it's a series? If so, it's like the first in a series. Well, how interesting. And that's all we have for today. in the wor world of whoops darker crime and thrillers that does sound interesting i'm going to check that one out very interesting all righty well tomorrow we're looking at a romance a complete 180. it's probably more christmas rom-coms i haven't looked <laughs> uh announcement yes i do have sprints tonight at 8 p.m eastern they'll go for two and a half hours bring your own book work on a project or just close your eyes it's just time carved out for you for self-care we listen to ambiance you don't have to chat if you don't want to we just mostly do the sprinting we do a little check-in at the top of each of the two hours and at the final one if you want to share your progress or let let us know how you're doing no pressure i do those three times a week um so uh i'm gonna grab up keo grab up my stuff i gotta get to the grocery store before i get to work and so on i hope you guys have a very good tuesday reading good books and as the banner says don't be a bookworm be a bookie monster um, um, um. have a good day god bless